but just barely. Good morning, everyone. Glad to have you here with us today. My name is James Sears. I'm the pastor here at Roy Christian. Um, thanks for coming uh, to join us for a morning of worship. Uh, we are here um, to help you uh, make and strengthen a life-changing connection with Jesus, with his family, the church, and with the rest of the world. If there's any way that we can help you, please uh, let us know. Grab one of our leaders this morning uh, and see uh, what we can do to help uh, in some meaningful way. Yesterday, uh, May the 18th, was the Pregnancy Medical Clinic Steps for Life walk. Um, our friends at the PMC send their thanks um, for supporting them and their efforts to impact and improve the lives of women in unexpected pregnancies. It was a beautiful morning. Um, had uh, a lot of uh, a lot of friends out there. Um, I look forward to hearing their final report. Um, if you were one of the walkers, would you stand up for just a second? One of the walkers at the at the park. Awesome. <clears throat> uh, I'm confident that if you still wanted to give, you somehow didn't get that opportunity, I'm pretty sure that the PMC will still let you do that. So uh, uh, this morning, uh, Jen and Tony Brown are here uh, from Intermountain Christian Camp. Uh, they're going to be sharing in a little bit about what's been going on at the camp and what's coming up uh, and to do whatever arm twisting is necessary uh, to get our kids up there uh, for a week in Fairfield. So I'm looking forward to hearing their report in just a little bit. Um, next Sunday, Al Eskew is going to have a short presentation on the upgrades uh, we've made to our security and safety uh, systems here at the church. Um, that'll be at the end of the service. Um, we hope you'll stick around for that. Um, there will be a little demonstration, so you won't want to miss it. Uh, June the 2nd, uh, just two weeks away, is our annual Youth Scholarship Dessert Auction. Uh, the youth group is going to be raising funds um, with a potato bar lunch, followed by uh, our annual dessert auction for the scholarship fund. Um, if you would like to uh, make and donate some dessert items for the auction, um, there will be a way for you to do that through the Realm connect stuff this week. Um, if that terrifies you, come on, seriously, don't be scared. Um, you can talk to Tina, uh, you can talk to me, and we will get you fixed right up uh, with that. Um, we typically raise over a couple thousand dollars for the Youth Scholarship Fund. Um, I'm anxious to see what kinds of pies, cookies, cakes, cheesecakes, brownies, pops, whatever it is um, that will show up. It's a lot of fun, and hopefully you'll stick around for that on June the 2nd. And that's also the day that we're going to be promoting our uh, children uh, into the next grade and recognizing our, uh, our high school graduates as well. Uh, hopefully you picked up a bulletin on the way in. Um, there is a lot of information uh, in, uh, in here about several upcoming events for children, youth, and adults. That's why we put it inside this so you can take it with you. Um, you also can get that information through our newsletter. If you're not getting that, uh, fill out one of the connection cards and drop that in the, uh, in the boxes on your way out this morning. Um, and that'll show up in your box every Wednesday or so. <clears throat> uh, we have had just a few prayer requests in the prayer chain this week. Um, let me go over those uh, quickly, uh, just to kind of r refresh everybody's memory. Uh, first of all, um, Reuben Bennett uh, asked us to be praying for his brother, Charlie. Uh, he was diagnosed with cancer in one of his kidneys. They will remove that kidney on Wednesday. <clears throat> Donnell Nielsen's mother, Carolyn Sharp, passed away on Thursday. If you would pray for, uh, for Donnell and her family. 
Uh, and Joanne Purdy asked us to pray for Brent Taylor. Uh, Brent's going to be having open heart surgery uh, in a couple weeks on June the 13th. So if you would uh, keep those things in mind uh, as we pray this morning. I know you've been praying for them um, throughout the week. Let's take a moment um, to uh, talk to our Father, um, to offer him up this uh, time of worship and fellowship, uh, and to uh, ask his blessing on our gathering. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for, um, for the new life that we see all around us as things are growing and blooming. Um, we are, are so grateful for the promise of new life. Um, after a season of cold and gray and um, not, not very beautiful or, or comfortable, um, we are glad uh, that there is the promise of change. Um, we thank you for your blessings to us, um, for uh, how very good you've been to us in these last several days. Uh, we've been praying for these friends and many other things as well over the last few days. Um, we ask that you would continue uh, to watch over these friends or these family members and because you are good, because you're powerful, because you are loving, uh, that you would, uh, you would bless them, that you would give them exactly what they need at just the right moment. And Lord, we also uh, offer ourselves up to be the answers to our own prayers, um, that we would be the ones who would bring comfort, that we'd be the ones who would carry your encouragement uh, to those who are in need. Thank you, Father, um, for um, creating us to be who we are. Um, we, we are so very privileged to be a partner with you uh, in bringing your light and hope and joy into the world. It's through the name of Christ Jesus, our Savior, we pray. Amen. Um, When I moved to Utah um, 22 years ago, I moved into a condo um, just off of 5600, um, brought all my stuff in, um, got a little bit of it unpacked, and then Dennis sent me to church camp for a week in a van I'd never driven, with children I'd never met, to a state I'd never visited before. I had no idea where I was going. It was a terrifying experience. So I came home after that week of camp, and um, I had a week to recover, and then he sent me to another week of camp <laughs> with a different batch of kids, <clears throat> uh, and I have, um, have come to very much appreciate uh, what goes on at Fairfield, um, the lives that have been changed there at camp, the decisions that have been made um, to serve Jesus either in a full-time vocational way, like our own sweet Anthony Borelli, who is here this morning, uh, or people who have just committed to walking closely with Jesus in whatever career they have. Um, uh, Church camp is a big deal. So uh, I'm going to have... Tony and Jen Brown come up. We uh, haven't had a chance to meet before um, this morning, um, but they're um, managers at the camp, and so they're going to come and talk to us for a few minutes about what's going on up there at Fairfield. I think there's some pictures and some video to share as well, so come on up. Right again. Good morning. Good morning. Here we go. My name's Tony. This is my wife, Jen. And uh, together with our 16-year-old daughter, Ashton, we are the new managers at the Christian camp. And um, it has been a fun, fun story of ours of how we ended up there. So we got married in uh, 2002. Yep. So I, I sometimes I'll mess that. I'll, I'll, I'll go longer if need be. Um, anyways, uh, our story really started in 2016. I was a, uh, a full-time plumber for many, many years, and I worked a lot of hours. And that year, 
God laid it on our hearts to change things up so I could be home with my, my girls more. And, um, and so we did. We listened, and, uh, and I quit my job and got a, got a job in maintenance up in the Wood River Valley. And, um, and just, yeah, I was able to have a lot more hours to spend with my girls, and, and that was important to me. Um, the next year, in 2017, Jen was invited to come up to the camp and be the uh, camp cook. And that's where we really started to spend some time up there with, uh, with the kids, and, and we really fell in love with it. Um, so fast forward to 2020 is where things really picked up, is in November of 2020, God laid it on our hearts to sell our house and for me to take another job closer to home in, in the uh, maintenance industry of the school there in Fairfield. And so we sold our house and started a new job. And within a month, we were living with my mom and uh, wondering, huh, this is, this is interesting. You know, God's, God's got some plans coming our way. Or we're sense of humor. Or sense of humor. <laughs> that summer, um, we moved our camper up to the camp. Um, and so we could just live there while she cooked. And so we lived out of our camper. And the current manager at that time, um, Chris Fredrickson, he came up to me and said, so what's your plan? Um, you know, you guys don't have a house, and you're living here at the camp. Um, what's your plan? And I said, you know, I think this fall you're going to come downstairs in your home, look in your dining room, and I'm going to have a cup of coffee, and you're going to wonder how the Browns moved in. <laughs> um, anyway, so that summer we... Uh, we started praying. We started praying, you know what? This, the camp could use another family. And so we, we started praying, and within two weeks, um, a member from a church over in Boise said, you know what? Our church has a double-wide modular that we need to get off of our property. And we thought, wow. So, you know, how can we make this work? And then pretty soon a board member said, I'll fund it. So... They funded bringing, bringing that home up there, and uh, <laughs> oh, it, was, it was a whirlwind. But yeah, within that year, the house was sitting on the foundation, and then the next year, using my plumbing, HVAC, electrical, drywall, roofing <laughs> skills, um, <laughs> we got this place livable, and we, we ended up moving in November of 22. It was a, it was a lot of fun. Um, so we've been up there for a year and a half now, but last December, Chris, the, the manager at the time, said, you know, God is pulling me to be a deputy sheriff here in Fairfield. He goes, what would you and Jen think about possibly becoming the managers? And we were thinking, you know what, we'll pray about it, but we really think God has been taking us here, I mean, the whole time. So, so we prayed about it, and then... Uh, March of this year, the board voted us in, and we became the full-time managers. Um, Chris, um, the previous manager, came the assistant manager. We just flip-flopped. Um, and then Cecil Swinson, who was before Chris, to jump back. Anyways, um, he's also the assistant manager. So we have three families up there on property now, which is really, really cool because we have a lot of projects and a lot of growth and with all our skills combined, we're able to, to really put a lot of these to use. So, um, and I'll actually kind of jump into some of the projects that we've done this year. So I think on slide one, so we had a, uh, a longtime family uh, of the camp, their son is doing an Eagle project. And he wanted to spruce up the obstacle course. So they went in there and, and, and ripped it all out and cut down trees and, and chipped it all up and, and really cleaned it up. So this year the kids will have an obstacle course that they can use. Um, now, another thing that we have done, because we are bursting at the seams. Um, in fact, we were telling a little story. I'll try not to go too long. We're telling a little story about this winter camp. We had so many kids that we had to take our own youth group from Fairfield and take them up to one of our personal houses for the weekend because we filled up every bed. So on that note, this spring we had two work groups um, say, what can we do? And I said, you know what? We need bunk beds. If we can put bunk beds in each one of these cabins, we can have 36 kids and more, two, 
to, on top of just to give us some more beds. So we had the work groups come in, and in and, and one weekend they built them, the second weekend they polished them up and sanded them. Um, and then we got some mattresses, and now we're, we're ready. We got 36 new kids. However, the kitchen is bursting at the seams, as my wife can tell you. And so we really needed to get to the point where we could serve quicker. Um, and so we were able to do a kitchen remodel and add another serving window, um, which we'll be able to, to utilize this year. In fact, it's just wrapping up. So this year we'll be able to actually serve through two windows to speed up the, the service there for the food. Um, so we are, just, we are just growing like crazy, which is so much fun. And then on the bottom right-hand corner, you can see <laughs> um, somebody had the bright idea that we should get a dunk tank. And that could help with our, with our missions and, um, and also give the kids another activity. So anyway, so we got a dunk tank and that'll be my project the next two weeks is to give it a nice little overhaul and facelift. And um, I was the first one to try it. It was cold, and I, but I, I figured if anyone was gonna get hurt, um, it might as well be me. So anyways, anyways so that's kind of where we're at on the, uh, the projects for this spring. And I'll pass it over to my bride to talk about the camp. Okay. So you can see up on the projector, this year's theme is kingdom. We are so excited. We have lots of camps that are happening. You can see the whole host of them here. We even put a QR code for you parents up there who want to sign your kids up. We are super excited about what is happening, all the camps that are coming. Um, there is just... We're just really excited to be here and be a part of the camp and we're just super excited about the theme this year and the direction that the camp is going um on the the part that you really need to know is our why and it's all right seeing the kids just get excited about jesus and seeing that they're not the only kids you get to come up to camp and just be excited and feel empowered and it gives people kind of that confidence to take that home and share that love with Jesus with people as well. You get to deal with some of the hard things that, that, that you struggle with every day when you look into the mirror. And, and it gives you an opportunity to have truth poured into your life so that the next time you go look at that person in the mirror, you know what God says about that person and, and not what the world says about that person. I would definitely recommend you come to camp because it's just a great time to hang out and have this fellowship of believers. And it's just great. You know, seeing is believing and seeing the smiles on their faces and the stuff they're doing, hearing the leaders talk about it, it it's hard to not get excited. Like, it just puts a smile on my face. And camp isn't just fun. It's so much more. Um, we looked up to pull current statistics, and we were shocked to find out that 63% of adults say that they accepted Christ between the age of 4 and 14. And we are primed for that opportunity to be able to speak to those kids from second grade all the way through high school. And it's an amazing opportunity. Um, why we believe so strongly in the camp is because of the directors that we have put in place for each one of those camps that we showed on that slide. They work tirelessly to share biblical truths in age-appropriate ways to kids that just speak into their lives. Um, from the main sessions to the small groups, it's a time to share the gospel message and to learn more. And it's just great to see how it's impacting these kids, especially, you know, when we start with these little bitty guys and they just go all the way through high school and it's so neat to see them evolve. You know, what were, what were you, Anthony? Were you like a sophomore when I met you? And to see where God is taking him, to watch Cora grow up. She's the same age as our daughter. I remember my daughter talking about you in junior camp and the friendship that they were in the same cabin. And she's like, Mom, I met this really neat girl, and her name's Cora. And to watch them grow up, it's so cool. And so cool to watch their faith deepen. Um, you can see up here, this is one of my favorite camps. I've never gotten to participate in it, but I get to see the results. It's always interesting being in the kitchen. I see the kids three times a day. That's it. <laughs> I roll the window. We serve food. I roll the window back. This camp is so remarkable. Advanced Leadership Camp is for when your high schooler 
is been having fun at camp, but they're like, I'm ready to go deeper. I want to know more. I want to grow more. I want to become more. This camp does that. It takes the kids and teaches them how to take hold of their faith, to go deeper with their relationship in Christ, and to stand firm when the world comes at them. And we really get to see that rolling the window for each meal. You get to see this progression of when they come in and fresh-faced, and then they go deeper and they learn more. And you can see the change on their face as they work through this camp. The numerous deep relationships and leaders that have been forged out of this camp, it carries over to all the camps. We see leaders being built that then end up leading in our, not just counselors, but the other kids in high school camp gravitate towards them because they have this something inside, this deeper sense of what God is doing in their life that other kids gravitate towards. Um, we really want to see all our camps fill up this year, but this one, it really ends up changing their lives, changing their direction, not only like pushing them into ministry, but it cements them so when we launch them into the world, they know that they know that they know that their God is their God. It's not their parents' God. It's their God. And it's amazing to watch. Um, it's our very first camp of the year, so we get really excited to see what God does there and how it progresses. We are hoping and praying to see all our camps at max capacity this year with extra bunk beds, extra serving lines. We just can't wait to see it. Um, on the next slide you can see what is coming soon. Um, we're not just focused on this year's camps. We are working forward. God is leading us to plan for the coming years and that you guys can help with that. Um, click one more time. This is an Alpine Tower. This is what we hope is the start of our ropes course. It is 40 feet tall, three-sided structure, looks kind of intimidating. Now. I want to read this next section because it's really important to me to get the wording right because we feel so strongly about this. Now, an alpine tower makes people use teamwork and cooperation to make it to the top. Our kids are living in a day and age where the internet shows they, they either have to be absolutely perfect or they're going to end up making it onto an epic fail montage. They ha are never shown the 12 hours of cut footage that it took the hard work to get there. Now, this tower gives kids the chance to succeed through failing forward. A chance for the shy kid to help problem solve and how to try again. A chance for the athlete that thought this would be so easy to struggle a little bit. Both of these kids to work together and realize they need each other to try again and to make it to the top. All of that is important for them to learn because God made them unique and that he loves them and that in spite of their best or failed efforts, not just the 30-second edited clip that shows the perfection. Now, it's a big project. I said it's over 40 feet tall, right? It's $120,000. Currently, we have about 13,000 pledged, but we found a way to make this work. If we can find 100 people that can give $100 a month for a year, it would be completely financed. And that's amazing to be able to use this to show Christ's need for the kids and what they can do. Um, we'd be fully funded in a year. And it would be another, not only activity, but another way to show Christ to the kids. So, and the next slide. These are also some of the other projects we have on the horizon. We are working on an in-ground pool. Um, right now, we have an above-ground pool. Uh, we have some donors on the board that are working to make this happen. In fact, it might even break down, break down, break ground in the next couple of weeks, which is amazing. Uh, we also want to expand our pond for water activities, for different stuff for the kids to do, so to get it bigger. And taking two acres of our um, acreage and turning it into a really nice grassy lawn for activities and games and just giving the kids more things that they can do while they're up there. Now, we know we've just, like, laid all this information on you guys, and it was a lot. So let us condense it down to how you can support us. So the first way 
would be that you can make a donation of any size to the camp in general, or you could donate to a special project like the pool, like the ropes course, <laughs> things like that. You can also, you could donate to your church scholarship fund, or you could even be a volunteer as a counselor, or I hear you might be able to buy a dessert at an auction soon. You can also, um, you can help find others that if you're not able to support the ropes course through donating $100 per month, maybe you know somebody who is. Getting the word out and sharing the project and what's going on, it's another great way to support us. And last but certainly not least, you can cover us in prayer. The camps, the directors, the counselors, our volunteers, the campers themselves, and our staff that's there all summer long. It's a really big thing to be covered in prayer, and boy, can we tell the difference when we're covered in prayer or when we're not, and it's amazing. We host camps every year, and we see hundreds of kids. Our motto at camp is camp changes lives, which it does, but we humbly ask you not just to pray for change, but to pray for a revival that starts with your kids coming to God's camp. If you guys want to talk more about this, we're going to be in the back after service. Come and talk to us. We, we could talk for hours <laughs> about camp and our excitement being up there and being the new managers and what God's doing and what we see now. And I can't wait to see what this summer holds. So thank you. Uh, just to make sure that you know that <clears throat> uh, we made a commitment this year again that anybody who goes up to camp, um, the church is paying half of the registration fee. Um, if people need more help with uh, with funds, we absolutely will make that happen. You just need to come talk to me or to uh, to Julie, uh, and we'll uh, we'll make sure that happens. We don't want money to be the issue that uh, keeps somebody from camp because camp really does make a difference. <clears throat> uh, we began a, uh, a new sermon series uh, last week on Mother's Day. Uh, we're learning how to fight for your family and why we need to fight for our family. Uh, in Nehemiah 4, uh, the call is given to the Jews uh, as they uh, work to rebuild their city. Remember the Lord, who is great and awesome, and fight for your families, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your homes. We need to fight for our families. Uh, it is no secret that today's families need all kinds of um, support and direction and hope and encouragement. Uh, in our series, we're going to uh, talk about the enemy, uh, enemies of the home, uh, and hopefully that we'll see that there is great hope uh, for marriages and families of, uh, of every kind. This morning's uh, message is called Children, a Special Gift from God. Uh, and I, you know, I guess i would just go ahead and throw my kids under the bus right now. They are special. And some of them are more special than others. Uh, maybe you feel the same way about your kids. I know my mom who is here feels the same way about her children, me being the favorite. Sorry, Tim. <clears throat> but uh, children are a special gift from God. And I will say, like I did last week, if you don't have children, I believe that there's still something important for you in this message. Um, if you have struggled um, to, um, to have kids uh, or there's been some tragedy in your family, the message might be a little painful, but I'm, I'm hopeful that you will still see um, that there is something here um, for you. Psalm 127 verse 3 says, Children are a heritage from the Lord. Offspring are a, a reward from him. Children are a special gift from God. But not everybody believes that. 
I was kind of surprised uh, in the last couple of weeks as I was trying to put this series together. Uh, I thought it would be sort of a slam dunk, easy thing. You just type in children gift from God. There are some people who are really opposed to that idea um, because of their experiences, because of <clears throat> whether it's experiences with God in prayer about a growing family or uh, other tragedy that's taken place. They're just really kind of opposed to that idea that children are a blessing and a gift. They see them as more like an inevitable consequence and sometimes a curse. Um, children are a heritage from the Lord. They are a gift from God. And not everybody believes that. But if they did, they would treat their children better. I did a little bit of research this week. Um, just kind of got curious. Uh, if you uh, go to showuputah.org, you'll find some statistics about what's going on um, here and around the country. <clears throat> uh, there are... There are 2,600 children, 2,600 children in foster care in Utah. The most recent national number um, from the end of 2021 is 391,000. That's, that's a pretty big number. There were 40,364 reports of child abuse and neglect in Utah. 20,713 uh, 20, were accepted for assessment. A total of 7,334 cases were confirmed, and there were 10,654 confirm, confirmed child victims in those cases. About 70% of the allegations were child endangerment, domestic violence-related child abuse, sexual abuse, and other neglect. That doesn't include emotional abuse, alcohol or substance use or exposure, neglect, or non-supervision. 10,654. Now, I don't like any of those numbers. Um, <clears throat> maybe... Uh, maybe you don't either. Uh, as you um, m might know or imagine, um, foster care is a big deal to our family uh, and uh, to a few others here in the church. May is National Foster Care Month. Uh, we announced last Sunday that we're going to be collecting cleaning supplies for families um, over the next few weeks. Um, there's a table in the fellowship hall where you can leave individual supplies, or if you want to put together your own little family cleaning supply caddy, um, there is, hopefully you got one of these when you came in. Um, if not, I think there's some of these on the table. But here's some of the things that you can bring, which will help families get their homes back under control so their children can can come back home. <clears throat> Children are a special gift from God, regardless of what the rest of the country or the rest of our state is doing with children. Um, we believe that God's word makes it very clear that they are a special gift from God. So this morning, I would like for us to look at just a few things that we learn about children from God's Word. Uh, and it's, it's quick this morning. Number one, God has a plan for children. God has a plan for children. 
In Jeremiah 1.5, um, the Lord is speaking to the prophet Jeremiah and says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. God had a plan for Jeremiah's life. In Psalm 139, a passage that we've heard many times, usually um, sort of in conjunction with the pregnancy medical uh, clinics uh, themes. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. What does it tell us? God has a plan for our lives. For every child, he has a plan. Regardless of the circumstances of a child's conception, from the moment of conception, God places a soul creating every child in his own divine image. He designs each of us with specific spiritual gifts, with hearts kind of dialed in to a v- uh, various passions, with talents and abilities, and unique personalities, some uniquer than others for sure. And then he leads us through a wide range of experiences to prepare us to serve him, to serve his kingdom, and to serve others. God does not make secondhand, worthless, junky garbage. We are his workmanship. A great work with divine inspiration and preparation and creation. You may have certain plans and dreams for your children. Rodeo cowboy, doctor, teacher, marine, artist. I don't know. God has certain plans and purposes for his children as well. Children are valuable to Father God. God has a plan for his children. Another thing that we learn as we look through Scripture is that Jesus placed a high value on children. <clears throat> In his day and time, children were not loved and adored and spoiled as they are, especially here in the great state of Zion. Children didn't rule the roost. They were sort of a natural consequence. When a mommy and a daddy love each other very much, there's, there's a child. They were seen as property. They were seen as a burden. They were sort of a necessary evil to f- take care of the farm, to carry on the family business, to make sure that your, um, your legacy went on and on. But they really weren't loved the way that we expect people to love children. Jesus kind of turns all that on its head. He echoes the sentiment that, Jesus, or that, that children can bring great joy to a family. In John 16, verse 21, Jesus is talking and says, A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. There's joy when a child is born into the world. Jesus embraced children when no one else did. In Matthew chapter 18, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, and whoever welcomes one small child in my name welcomes me. Jesus loved kids. He saw that they had value. 
In the next chapter, chapter 19 of Matthew, he again shows the value he places on children. Uh, Then people brought little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and to pray for them. But the disciples rebuked them. Get these kids out of here. He doesn't have time for them. But Jesus said, let the little children come to me. Don't hinder them. For the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. Jesus took time to express care for them and to embrace them. People don't suddenly get spiritual value when they turn 18 or 21. They have eternal value from the moment of conception. Whether we have our own children or not, the next generation needs to hear and to see God's truth alive in us. Discipling and challenging our children to grow in Sunday school and vacation Bible school and church camp and youth group isn't the job of just one staff member or a couple of volunteers. It is a responsibility that we all share. If you don't know the kids in church, why not? Why don't you know them? You need to talk to them. They're going to run away, and they're going to be weird because that's what they do. But they need to know that somebody besides mom and dad care about them being here. That spiritual growth is valuable not just in their family, but it's important to all of us. You need to get to know the next generation in the church. Connect with the kids here. Introduce yourself. Make them sit down and eat a donut with you. See what it is that they've mixed into their hot chocolate in the morning. Talk to them. Connect with the children in your neighborhood, across the cul-de-sac, around the corner. Pray for them. Serve them. Volunteer to help them develop a strong, solid, personal relationship with Jesus. Some kids that are coming here are doing it because they want to be here. Mom and dad are not really excited about it. We need to make sure that, that our kids know the value that God places on them, the value that Jesus sees in them, the value that we see in them, not just as the next generation of leaders, but as people who have an eternal soul that's valuable to God. And I think one of the last um, things that we learn in Scripture about children uh, is about our impact. Our impact on children is fleeting and eternal. Like, wait a minute, James, that's... That can't be true. It's fleeting and eternal. Yeah. The time that we have with our children is deceptively quick. Every new parent gets the same advice. Don't blink because it's going to fly past, right? We must make the most of the time that we have available to exert influence and to have impact on sweet young lives. Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 9 says, be careful. Watch yourselves closely so that you do not forget the things your eyes have seen or let them fade from your heart as long as you live. Teach them to your children and to their children after them. The time we have with them to have impact, to exert influence is quick. And whatever we've experienced with God, we need to be sure to not forget those for ourselves, but also to pass those on to our children and on to our grandchildren. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4 says, Fathers, it can also just mean parents. Parents, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Nobody else is going to teach your kids about faith. Nobody is going to teach your grandchildren about 
having a relationship with God. It's up to you. They need to see it in your life, but they also need to hear the words. They need to have a conversation with you. Why are you a Christian? What has God ever done for you? What, what sacrifices have you made? What, what have you experienced because of your devotion to Jesus? Bring your children up in the training and instruction of the Lord because of the next promise that comes from Proverbs 22. Start children off on the way they should go, and even when they're old, they won't turn from it. Not everybody has had that experience. There are a lot of kids who grew up in church with devoted Christian parents who have not come back. Once they left the house, that was it. But the hope and the prayer is that those lessons that they learned, the, the truth of, uh, from God that they received, is in there somewhere bang around in their brain, bang around in their heart and soul. Um, and God's Holy Spirit is still using that truth to have influence in their lives. This last week, Cora had a, a final project, um, an interview for school, that she made me sit down. She didn't want to call it what it really was. Like, what was life like back then, Dad? Um... I forget what, what the nice uh, name of it was that our teacher gave, but it's basically comparing then and now. How are the decades different? And one of the questions she asked, again, ah, kind of got me. I wasn't expecting it. Um, but I had an answer. I just don't know that I ever shared it um, with, with her. What do you hope for your children? Well, <laughs> there have been a lot of hopes. There have been a lot of dreams. Um, I, and I believe every parent has the same, the same sort of hopes and dreams for their kids. But at this point, um, with the age that my kids are, I'm looking for three things. I hope for integrity, morality, and spirituality. As much as I would love for my kids to be Fortune 500 world-famous class surgeons and artists, as much as I think that would be awesome, that's really not my biggest goal. My biggest goal for them is that they will have, first of all, that they'll have a connection with Jesus. Not just because preacher dad has drug them to church again for something else but that it, it will be a real relationship that they have with God on their own. And that because of that spiritual life, that there will be morality, they'll be able to make good choices, and that there will be integrity, that what they say they believe is actually fleshed out in what they do every day. Be a billionaire, live in a van down by the river, as long as you've got these other things under control, dad is okay with it. Uh, John, uh, the old apostle, said about uh, of children that were not biologically his, but spiritually his, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. That's what we want for our children. Because God has given them to us as a special gift. And not just to mom and dad but to grandparents, to aunts and uncles, to friends and neighbors, to church family. When AJ came to be a part of our family, some of you said, he is not just your kid, he's the church baby. Like, well then where are you at 2 o'clock in the morning when he's screaming his brains out? <laughs> but it really is true. When God gives children, he's not just giving it to a mom and a dad, but he has given it to a family, a, a larger family, to all of us. God creates children with a purpose. He has a plan for their lives. 
You're one of his children. He has a plan for you. He has a purpose for you. Jesus places a high value on children. He places a high value on you so much that he's willing to die so you could be with him forever. Our impact on children is fleeting and eternal. Our lives are a blip so fast. They take forever when you're going through it. But you look back and poof. It's, it just has, it's vapor. But it is also eternal. Your eternal soul matters to God. It matters to me. Hopefully it matters to you as well. Children are a special gift from God. And so are you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the chance we've had to be together this morning. We are glad that you have made us to be who we are. Maybe we would choose to be taller or stronger or prettier or more athletic or more artistic. I mean, we, we're constantly comparing ourselves to someone else. But we know that you have created us to be who we are for a reason. And Lord, we pray that through our study of your word, through our prayer time, and through the guidance of your Holy Spirit, that we would find more and more clearly what your plans are for our lives. We thank you for the price that Jesus paid for us. Because we have value in his eyes that he was willing to take on a horribly um, awful death. Lord, we look forward to an eternity in your presence. After a life of faithful service and worship here, we get to be in your presence, enjoying your presence, enjoying your favor, living the kind of life that you always intended for us. We thank you um, for these incredible gifts you've given it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. I forgot this cute little thing that I wrote. It's called, Be Careful, Mom and Dad. Oh, be careful, Mom and Dad, where you go. Be careful, Mom and Dad, where you go. There's a child at your feet who will follow where you lead. Oh, be careful, Mom and Dad, where you go. Oh, be thoughtful, Mom and Dad, what you say. Be thoughtful, Mom and Dad, what you say. There's a child with good ears who will repeat what they hear. Be, be thoughtful, Mom and Dad, what you say. Oh, be intentional, Mom and Dad, what you do. Oh, be intentional, Mom and Dad, what you do. There's a child down below who will mimic what you show. Oh, be intentional, Mom and Dad, what you do. Oh, be prayerful, Mom and Dad, for your kid. Oh, be prayerful, Mom and Dad, for your kid. There's a child with a soul. <laughs> what a disastrous, horrible, emotional morning, apparently. There's a child with a soul who needs God's word and care to grow. Oh, be prayerful, Mom and Dad. For your kid. Copyright James Sears, May 24. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, as soon as my nose stops running, we'll move on with the Lord's Supper. Uh, four men would come and um, begin to distribute the communion elements to the congregation. Uh, we celebrate the Lord's Supper every week. Uh, it's open to everybody who counts themselves as a follower of Jesus. Um, we would um, invite you to come and to be uh, a part of the table, but it's not really our invitation, it's Jesus's. Uh, these uh, few thoughts this morning are from a man named Edwin White in the Christian Standard um, a few weeks ago. He writes about Isaiah's picture of the gentle servant. 
Isaiah's picture of the gentle servant of the Lord presents him as one who doesn't seek confrontation, whose voice is not like a protester screeching out complaints in the streets. He is instead very gentle. Math, uh, Jesus quotes it in uh, Matthew 12, uh, also from Isaiah 42. Here is my servant whom, I'm, whom I have chosen, the one I love and whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will proclaim justice to the nations. He will not quarrel or cry out. No one will hear his voice in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out, till he has brought justice through to victory. In his name the nations will put their hope. There are two metaphors in this um, passage that Isaiah uses to illustrate the gentleness of Jesus. The first has to do with agriculture. When young reeds are being transplanted, they're very easy to bruise, and when they are bruised, one must take care, uh, take great care to keep from breaking them as they move from one location to another. Such gentle, tender handling of plants illustrates the way that Jesus handled fragile people. He did not break bruised hearts. Anyone who came to him with a sincere heart found comfort, encouragement, and forgiveness. The second metaphor is from a fire starting process. Dry flax often was used for that purpose. A tiny spark alighting on a piece of flax would begin to smoke. Gentle blowing on it would cause the spark to brighten until a flame would appear. But if a person blew too vigorously, it would put out the flame. Gentleness was required for the process. Again, if anyone came to Jesus with a tiny spark of faith in their heart, Jesus would gently fan that spark to make it grow. The father of a boy came to the disciples. They couldn't cure him. Then Jesus came and the father said, If you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. Jesus said, if you can, everything is possible for the one who believes. Immediately, the, father's, uh, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. Notice how gently Jesus led the man to greater faith and how the man asked for and received the strengthening of that faith through the miracle of his healing for his son. At the table, we come to remember our gentle Savior. Even though Jesus was never violent, the authorities seized him like a criminal, rushed him through a trial with a predetermined verdict, and handed him over for execution. They took his gentle hands and nailed them to a cross, and it fulfilled God's plan to provide a way for each of us to have a home in heaven. Let's bow our hearts before him to honor and adore him as we prepare to take of the Lord's Supper. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for gentle Jesus, for the way that he deals with our failures, with our flaws. He doesn't browbeat us. He doesn't discipline us. He doesn't scold us. He doesn't turn us away. But he encourages our faith to grow. He comforts us, helps us to see a better way. We thank you for what he's done for us on the cross, for the hope for eternity that we have because of him. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. In Mark 14, we find Mark's account of the Last Supper. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it, this is my body. And then he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. He said to them, Truly I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. <clears throat>
Glad you could be with us this morning, whether you're right here in the room or watching from someplace else far away. Uh, we look forward to seeing you here very soon. We know that if you're watching online, you're probably checking us out. Hopefully you've seen we're okay. You can come and, and see us in, in reality. Um, may you feel the direction of the Holy Spirit this week. Uh, may the love of Christ compel you to share his good news with others, especially with the kids in your life. Our band is going to come now and lead us in a few minutes of worship. While they come, I'll say bye to those who are watching online. Uh, we're going to worship for a few more moments.